Hello, everyone. Welcome to MoCo's Most Famous. My name is Joe Yashroff. We're coming to you, as always, from our podcast studios at Montgomery Community Media in Rockville. Today, we will be spending time with Dr. Darian Pollard, who is president of Montgomery College just down the street from our studios here. Dr. Pollard, we have been trying to get you for a while, and you are a very busy lady, and we really, really appreciate you coming in. How are you today? Oh, I'm so grateful to be here. And I'm sorry we've had such a hard time organizing it, but we're here today and we're going to have a good time. Absolutely. No need to apologize. I'm just glad that you're here and that we're doing the podcast. Thank you. So uh, so it's summer now almost uh, for college presidents. So you're off. And there's nothing going on. And you, <laughs> you only start working again in September, right? That's how it works? Yeah, we don't live in your reality. <laughs> there. You know, our, this actually is pretty a uh, very busy time for us because mm-hmm. while the academic year is over, uh, we certainly have summer classes that start. Start, and then we're doing a lot of preparation for the forthcoming academic year. So a lot of planning, a lot of retreating, lots of review of materials. A lot of our data is coming in now, so we're analyzing that. So it's a it's a different type of work. Um, and then the other part is we still do a lot of work with the business community and then our community engagement work. So a lot of chamber events right about now, going to a lot of uh, community activities. So it's, it's a good time. It's just a different type of work than what we see in the academic year. I know the answer to this question is everything. But I'll say, what what is the main part of your job? If you had to pick one thing that is the biggest aspect of your job, could you pick just one thing? Well, I'm going to try since you asked that question, but I am an English major by training, so I'm going to have a lot of commas in there. So I'll Absolutely. tell you that. I think the Oxford most— Oxford commas? Uh, or? Uh, <laughs> that would be good. Um, I think that the most important part, I believe, is ensuring academic excellence. So my job is to uh, clear the pathway for the phenomenal faculty that we have to do the work that they do, uh, is to advocate for the resources they need in order to do that work, and ultimately, at the end of the day, is ensure that the college rises up to serve the community uh, that we're responsible for. So— Academic excellence and ensuring that is what I would say is my primary responsibility. And this is a slightly different question. Your biggest mission, I'm going to guess what it is, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. Would your biggest mission be making sure that every person has an opportunity for an education? Hey, we need to put you on a banner at the college. (laughs) But I I think there's an important part, and I really appreciate the question because, you know, when community colleges were started and the Truman Act put made the community colleges and called for a network of colleges that were post-secondary, but that were not uh, institutions that took students directly into the four-year institution, the idea is that we would be doing nation building and we'd be doing that by helping to create a middle class. So our job as a community college, particularly in a community such as Montgomery County, is to be uh, this refuge. Uh, we provide opportunities and access to higher education to, th- to those who may not normally have access to it. Uh, We work deliberately to ensure that uh, we stay academically and uh, financially accessible to these students. We make sure that uh, new immigrants to our community have access to the services that we provide. So access, I think, is our primary mission and doing that in a way that would be radically inclusive. That's what we like to say. Uh, No student in Montgomery County is expendable. So if we can figure out how we meet them where they are, we as an organization are really living our mission at that point. And how is that mission going over the last few years? You've been in McCormick College, I believe, nine years going on 10. Yeah. How is that mission going? Is it getting better? Or are you seeing um, improvements? I think the mission is just becoming more profound right now. Mm-hmm. I think that we're seeing a period of time where we see some of folks who uh, raise the question, of, is college even necessary? And they aren't asking that for every person. They're asking that for certain populations. And those populations they're asking about are the ones that we specialize in. So we have the opportunity to say, yes, college is not only uh, necessary, it's something that can be done to really lift the quality of the life in a community, which I think is the important part of what we do as a comprehensive community college. I think our mission is becoming richer as we're thinking deeply about who has access to higher education, who doesn't, uh, how we use our place to provide agency for our community, uh, how we invest in economic development, uh, how we think deeply about the ways in which our community is evolving around us and how we stay current and relevant to them. So I think for me, uh, as I move into this 10th year, I think I'm seeing a mission that is richer, uh, this bolder, um, and in some ways is shinier because I think right now people know what we do and how we do it. We just get to go all in on it in ways that they haven't seen us do before. 
Now, the Maryland DREAM Act is part of what you're talking mm-hmm. about now. Could you tell us a little about that and your role with yeah. that? So when I first arrived at the college, the Board of Trustees had done, I think, some very deliberate and bold leadership as a, as a board. And they said that uh, the county had invested significant amount of resources in this K-12 space and really said that students who come to this country and they may find out that they are undocumented or a new, a new residence and didn't have the appropriate paperwork, uh, that we would continue that investment in them. And they would say if they graduated from a Montgomery County uh, public high school that and they would then see, receive in-county tuition uh, at Montgomery College. And uh, I thought that was the, just the manifestation of this mission because what people fail to have in the other part of that conversation is the recognition that our community is more enriched when everyone is educated. So the Maryland Dream Act creates this opportunity and pathway, and I'm glad the legislature saw the need for that. This idea that if you live in Maryland, if you have the ability to go to high school in this community uh, for a certain number of years, you file a certain amount of paperwork regarding tax filings and make those payments to the government as you should, that you could come to your local community college, accrue your associate's degree at the income rate and then be able to transfer to a four-year institution. And I think that to me is the manifestation of our mission, but it also speaks to this deep commitment that Montgomery County has around social justice and this idea that we believe that we are much more effective as a community when we are indeed well-educated. I had a a donor one time who expressed uh, frustration that the college had a certain amount of scholarship dollars that were available to undocumented uh, students. He had a different word for them. And I said, well, let me talk to you about this. And he said, what? I said, why do you choose to live in Montgomery County? And he said, well, you know, we have a you know, wonderful community. We talked, he talked about the infrastructure and he went through all the assets that all of us think about when we think about Montgomery County. And I said, but don't you also choose to live here because this is a well-educated community? And I said, if you don't want to buy into my social justice mission of why we should be doing this, I think about it from a truly selfish perspective. We know that if you live in a well-educated community, you have lower crime crime rates, lower in need for social services. We know that you have greater investment in voting. We know that you have greater community participation and philanthropy and service. Would you not want to live in that community? So don't we have, isn't it in your best interest to ensure that everyone has access to higher education? And he kind of paused and he said, yeah, that's a good point. He said, I'll think about that. And that to answer, that's all I ask. And I think that's the beautiful part about living in Montgomery County. We live our values out loud. Does it make you sad that some people don't understand that or agree with that? I think it's a great word to say sad. I think sometimes it might make me sad, but I think the I if I believe in what this democracy is about, then these everyone is entitled to their opinion. Uh, my job is to offer thoughtful, compelling, insightful perspectives that may help open that, and at the same time, uh, listen to their thoughtful, insightful perspectives about things, and and not come to a point where we're fighting about the issue and that we're attacking each other, but rather we're having you know conversations of consequence and that we're understanding that. I do believe that we're better when we live in a community where we can have that. And right now we're so diametrically opposed to each other in so many different ways that I welcome the conversation. I welcome the idea that we can create the spaces for those dialogues, even if we don't agree on the outcomes. And we live in a time, um, especially the last couple few years where, um, Respectful discourse is not common. Civility is doesn't seem common. Does that make you sad? You know, yeah. that 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 wounds me. And I think it wounds the republic as well. Mm-hmm. I have a sign in my yard that it says, love your neighbor, even if your neighbor uh, speaks a different language than you, loves differently than you, worships differently than you, has different political opinions than you, voted differently than you did, love your neighbor. And I think that that to me is the essence of what we should be talking about right now. We have abandoned the the public space and the public square to be able to have robust dialogue. So instead, uh, we end up having these very pedantic, ignorant conversations where we are labeling each other with monikers that attack them personally. And it's without, on both sides. Oh, I, 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 yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't even taking a position no, no, one know, or the I other. Just, on bo- and, and, sure. and we've forgotten how to come into the public square mm-hmm. and have intentional conversations about difference and that we 
we can have a difference of opinion. Um, that's why I love working at a college. Uh, some part of me recognizes I've never left college because mm. I recognize this idea that here's an intellectual community. Um, I will never forget, I was at Iowa State University. I did my undergraduate and master's work there. And we had Angela Davis come to the oh, campus. Wow. And I remember the night that she was there, they had in this huge lecture hall and you had all the big donors in the front and they got to hear her and the faculty and the administration. And the graduate students, you know, took the riser seats in the back. But then the us undergrads, I, you know, I snuck in, I think. And <laughs> we were on the floor on the wings. And I remember listening to her and that intellectual stimulation that came. But the beauty about that was what happened the next day on campus. So I went into the faculty lounge in the building I was at, and there was a philosopher, a women's studies faculty member, a political scientist, and they're having a debate about the issues that Angela Davis raised. And then the graduate students tried to replicate that in the afternoon in the bar. So that night in the dorm room, you had some of the undergrads, we were all together trying to do the same thing intellectual curiosity, intellectual rigor, uh, the idea that we're going to think our way through something and then act on it versus just having an opinion, uh, the freedom of opinion without the freedom of thought. That to me becomes really problematic where we are right now. That's fascinating. So when you were there in the company of Angela Davis, did you know at the time that this was history? I mean, she's a big part of, a, of our country. I knew of her, obviously. Yeah. And having, you know, I, I was, my undergraduate major was religious studies and had mm -hmm. done a lot of work in black liberation theology. Mm -hmm. had uh, understood, obviously, a period of time that she and tried to understand it as much as I can, as one can do as a you know 20-year-old. But what I thought was very provocative about that is what it introduced me to. And that's why I've always loved being on a college campus, that you can have faculty who have these deep di disciplinary expertise. You can have guests who come on campus who can raise the mantle about different issues and really engage us. And at the same time, I get to go back and be reflective and still form my own opinions based on all of this input that comes from different places. So I don't necessarily know if I I knew Angela Davis, I'd heard of her, but I didn't know what she was doing to my mind and what that environment mm -hmm. did for me. Uh, it was so rich. That is fascinating. By the way, I could listen to you. This may go on for hours. I don't know what your schedule is the rest of the day, Dr. Pollard, but this may go You're on for so a few kind. hours. Thank you. Okay, so uh, one of the other things we were talking about Radical inclusion. Mm -hmm. Also, the um, Montgomery College's student success scorecard. Yeah. Can you tell us about what that is and, and how that's coming along? So about five years ago, we put together a, a document. And it actually, I think the first time we did it was paper. And then we've moved to an online mm -hmm. uh, instrument. Well, we have the ability for us as an organization to mark progress of students, looking at them at three significant points. Understanding who our students are when they come to us, how they progress through the institution, and then how they move into completion and how they move out. And what's important about this is that we're looking at key indicators of success so that we can start to improve how we uh, perform as an organization and the environment that we want to craft for our students. Here's the other thing that we've done. We've disaggregated that data by race. Uh, we've disaggregated that data by gender. And we also look at full and part-time status. Now, we're going to also do some things in the next iteration of this as we move past the five year to look at issues of poverty, uh, because we know that that actually actually is the number one barrier to college completion is poverty. But it also means you have a very complicated life. Uh, I grew up in poverty, so I know what it's like to have to go to college and then sometime be hungry. Mm -hmm. And now if you're hungry, you're not going to be paying attention. If you're wondering about where you're going to sleep that night, you're going to have a very hard time thinking about what's happening with you in, in front of pre-Raphaelite literature that a faculty member may be talking to you about. So we, we, we think deeply about that. Our scorecard has really been the next step of the work of Montgomery College, this idea of understanding understanding who the students are that come to us, what is our value added while they're here with us, and then they're reaching the goals that we have. Uh, President Obama at the time, it called for a significant increase in college completion. And he challenged all colleges, both two and four year, to increase uh, the numbers of students who complete. Uh, we know that at community college, our students, while we are typically designed to be a two-year program, our average student spends four to five years at our institution because they're going to school part-time. Mm -hmm. Uh, because oftentimes they come to us needing some form of remediation. So we know that their lives are extremely complex, but how do we rise up to meet them? And do we meet them where they are? 
So our scorecard is this way of looking at how we're doing and to mark our progress. So we're seeing significant gains. We're seeing students persist longer. We're seeing our retention. Our retention rate uh, from fall to spring is the highest it's ever been in the history of the organization. We're seeing time to degree go down. That's huge. We want students to spend more time in classroom, not spending more time uh, at the college and not uh, and just persisting and not actually get to completion. So we're very proud about the scorecard. And it also helps us think deeply about what we do. Why does it take students so long to get through developmental math? Our math faculty have taken that on and are doing powerful work to actually understand what's going on there. Going to college is not cheap. Now, going to Montgomery College is not as expensive as going to Maryland, It's not, which is not expensive as going to Harvard. So there are different levels. Yeah. How do you address those issues where some people just can't afford to go to college and they can't get scholarships? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wish that I had been smart enough as an undergraduate to attend a community college. And I will tell a little bit of my personal story because I think it gets to, if you don't mind, Absolutely. this answer that I hope will be well composed by the time I get to the end of the statement. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and my family always knew that I was going to college. We always said that. Uh, my sister and I are were academically successful. My mother died when I was very young, so I was primarily raised by my father. And we knew that we were going to college, went to a college prep high school. Um, but none of us actually knew what that meant. You know, how would one do it? First in the family to a complete college. And as a result of that, I will never forget this story. I, my senior year, we had to fill the FAPSA form out. This is a free financial aid form that you have mm -hmm. to complete to the government. So my father worked third shift at the time. And what you would do, we did as a family, um, if you needed daddy to sign something, you leave it on the kitchen table. My daddy got up at 10 o'clock in the nighttime, put on his, his pot of coffee, and he'd sign papers. He'd review our homework, all the types of things that parents do. But my FAPSA form sat on the kitchen table for like a week and a half. And I said, I, I need, he has to fill in the data and he's got to sign it. And my father, who's a very kind, he's a very humble man. Mm -hmm. I got up one night because I heard daddy get up and I said, daddy, you haven't filled out my FAPSA form yet. And he said, and, and I can count probably on one hand the number of times my father's raised his voice at me. He said, I'm not doing that. And I kind of looked and, you know, my eyes welled up and I just turned around and went to bed and I cried myself to sleep tonight. So I went in the next day and told my counselor, I said, I'm not going to college. My daddy won't fill out the FAPSA form. And she said, oh, she said, well, you know, let me call your father. And she called him. And then a couple of days later, um, I woke up in the morning. Envelope was on the take this to I think it was Miss Sharp was my counselor. I said, OK, so I took it to her and she opened it. And, and she said, do you know why your father didn't want to fill this form out? And I said, no, I don't understand why. We always talked about me going to college. She said, your father didn't want you to know that he raised you and your family on $10,000 that year. It was his pride. And he didn't think that his child needed to know that, to know what he had to do. I say that because, and I tell that story because we know that, as I said earlier, the number one barrier to college is finances. Mm -hmm. Even in a county such as Montgomery that has high concentrations of wealth, we also have high concentrations of poverty. And we have also a middle class for whom education is not a first choice, second choice, it's a third choice because of the high cost of living. For a family of four to live in Montgomery County and not receive benefits from the county, they make about 90 some thousand dollars a year. So if you think about that at the most basic level, if I have to choose between childcare, transportation, food, housing, education is going to be far down on that list. So for us, what we've been so benefit is that our board is committed to keeping tuition at a level that's accessible. We ask students to pay no more than 30 percent of the college's uh, total budget comes from student tuition. We also are very deliberate about our foundation that goes out and raises millions. I think last year, almost three million, over three million dollars of scholarships for students. And then hopefully what we also do is advocate so effectively with our county and state that they can contribute to us more deliberately because I never want, I never want one of my students to have to be at home explaining to their father or mother why they have to, how they pay for college. I don't, I don't want that to have to happen. Will we ever see a day where there's free education in this country? Hmm. I don't think so. I, I, I would like to think that we'll rec recognize that education is not a private good, it's a public good, mm -hmm. and that we'll understand and recognize that. But I think right now, until we start to understand 
the, the what happens when you're uneducated and until we start to redefine what it means to be college. Because mm-hmm. what people think of when they think of having a college degree, they think of a traditional baccalaureate degree from a college where you go away to. Right. What they fail to recognize is that college is also those students who are doing apprenticeship programs through Montgomery College, those who are doing short-term certificates and degrees. There are any credential that you need post-high school is offered at a community college. That means you're getting a college education. But we have to deconstruct this hierarchy and this, this belief that college means one thing. We have to do that until the country starts to do that and we start to have substantive conversations about how we're being left behind across the globe, nothing will happen. Much more with Dr. Darian Pollard after we pause for a short break. This is MoCo's Most Famous on My MC Media. MCM, your community media center, is making Montgomery County a great place to live through programs like 21 This Week. Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show keeps you up to date with the local political scene. Montgomery Community Media, our middle name is Community. Welcome back to MoCo's Most Famous on My MC Media. I'm Joe Yashroff, and we are continuing our fascinating discussion with Dr. Darian Pollard, president of Montgomery College. Dr. Pollard, uh, you touched on your upbringing in Chicago. Mm. You did not have the easiest life growing up in Chicago, did you? No. You know, it's interesting as you look back at it now, I think all of us know that how we grow up shapes your character. Mm-hmm. And I and I'd like to think about those things that I had. I think as a result, I think I shared a little while ago that my mother died when I was very young, yep. when I was four. And I primarily grew up uh, early on with an aunt who kept us during the week, my father's sister. And then on the weekends, uh, we came to be with my father until he remarried. And then then they separated. We went back to my aunt and it came back. So somewhat inst- unstable in that way. But there were certain truths that were always there. One is that my family and I, one of my strongest beliefs is that we have to help people be more resilient. So as a family, I believe in resiliency individually. That's a personal characteristic of my own, that a life can give you a lot of good things and give you a lot of bad things. And the difference is how you get back up again when you get those bad things. I believe in community. I grew up in a community where we were, uh, there were lots of people who helped ensure that my survival uh, was possible. And those were people in my church where I grew up, so I have a strong spiritual base. I'm not necessarily religious now, but very spiritual base. I grew up in a strong environment where public education was valued. So I obviously went to college and never left. I also believe that I was raised in the idea that communities help each other. I'll never forget we had a, a person across the street one of my sister friends there and uh, had a death in the family. I think it was her grandmother. She lived with her grandmother and the grandmother passed and we all knew on the block and it was just what we did. So all of a sudden, I remember in my family, uh, my father said, here, take this and put it on the porch. And it was some, you know, some stew or something. And we had put in a good Tupperware. And I said, daddy, we didn't put the name on it because, you know, your Tupperware, you got to make sure you put on a piece of tape, last name so you can go back and get it later, right? Well, he said, don't worry about that. And I walked over to put this on the stoop. The whole front porch was full because everybody in the community felt and knew that they wanted to be a part of helping that family through that moment. I so often tell time tell the story of it. I always would lose my hats and gloves. In Chicago, this is not a good idea. I, mean, I used to get in trouble. My father said, if you lose your gloves one more time, I'm not buying you anymore. Well, i walking home one day with one of my classmates and she didn't have any gloves. And we all knew that she came from a, a situation that was far worse than ours. And my sister, I looked at and I guess I said, here, take mine. And I gave her my gloves. And my sister said, oh, you're going to get in trouble. Mm. Daddy's not going to like that. But I walked in the door. And this was the big lesson. Even growing up in poverty, uh, growing up in an environment that wasn't always stable, I walked in and I said, Daddy, you know, before you, I, 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 he said, where are your gloves, dearie? And I said, Daddy, before you get started, let me tell you, Melba needed them. And I gave her my gloves. And I remember he just looked. And there were two things I remember that moment. One, he just paused and this look of pride Mm. that came on his face. And he said, baby, if somebody else needs something and need help, you always do it. And that, to me, has been such a huge part of my identity, this idea of community, of help, of resilience, of understanding that I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And if I remember that, that's always my guiding compass. So, yeah, 
Growing up was rough sometimes, but I know I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't have that. And I know that I've changed the trajectory of my family. So my wife and I parent this glorious little boy who is the love of my life. And But I know his life is profoundly different and enriched because of the experiences I had. But what I can do for him now as a result of having bounced through those things, I'm all right with that. You mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned your son. I was watching a TEDx Bethesda from about five years ago. Oh, boy. And you said you quoted your son who said, Mama, after I go to college, I will be an engineer, an artist, and a ninja. Uh, 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 he would be a ninja. ninja. Yeah. <laughs> God love him. And he was, I never forget, you know, you have a little kid in the back seat and you turn around and you talk to him and mm-hmm. he's talking and he tells me this. And I thought, well, I got you. I said, you know, Montgomery College, we have the number one transfer engineering program in the country. I got you there. We have phenomenal art programs, one of the best in the country in Tacoma Park, Silver Spring. Got you there. And then I thought, no, the ninja school, I'm going to have to work on that. But what I didn't say is how he started that sentence. I don't remember you said it after I go to college, mm-hmm. right? And here's a kid who was... His um, his great grandfather was the male version of the help. Maybe finished sixth, seventh grade, if you know, depending on who, you, what day you caught him asking that. His grandfather had a high school education, but his mother and his other mother both have advanced college degrees. So he knows that college means something in our family. And at four, he was able to say what his plans are going to be. And now he's in change his mind. You know, he's gone through a couple of phrases. Now he wants to be a gamer and he also wants to be a basketball player. But then the other day he says, Mama, I think I can do something in space. I said, you know what? I can work with that. So there you go. That's that's amazing. So you mentioned your wife. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Traditionally, college presidents are older Mm-hmm. Caucasian mm-hmm. males mm-hmm. that wear bow ties. Maybe I'm being a little. <laughs> maybe I'm being a little stereotypical. I apologize, but at least that's the perception for many ties, people. Though. You are an out African American woman, so you're you're not that. Yeah. So how hard was that to to break that ceiling to to break into this profession that is traditionally held by what I just described? Mm-hmm. You know, the interesting part about it, I, I know that my very existence sometimes confounds people. They're kind of like, how did she do that, or what? I have been so blessed, Joe. I have mentors who saw something in me that I, I mean, here I'm just a little brown girl from the south side of Chicago. You know, I was fortunate to get into Iowa State University, one of the best, you know, land grant institutions of this country. They, I went there. I, I had education that transformed me. I had opportunities. I had people, though, who intervened in my life. And when I started teaching, I've had mentors. I think about Russ Peterson. I walk off a stage and I had just done a presentation to faculty and he says, Darian, you're going to be a college president one day. And I thought, I just want to get tenure, Russ. He Mm. said, you're going to get tenure. He said, but let's talk about this pathway. You need to get back in school and get your doctorate. I'm like, I am just now, (laughs) you know, paying off school loans. And he was like, nope, you're going to do this. Um, People, Gretchen Naff, who put opportunities in front of me and said, I'm going to make an investment in you. I'm going to send you to this. I want you to come and sit with me at this. So for me, the irony and, and, and the path that I've had And the fact that I exist in this space may very well be something that you don't see. I've been so fortunate to have people who lifted me up, who encouraged me, who offered constructive feedback. Sometimes, Darian, you talk so fast, you need to slow down. Or you can't get that Chicago attitude all the time. You're going to have to figure out how to take it down a little bit. Um, Have you read about that before you formed an opinion? And those are very important parts about learning and growing. Humility. You know, my family, my church, this idea when I grew up about how you'd be of service to others. So perhaps I don't fit those stereotypes. And um, I'm fortunate to work for a board who told me, Darian, do you Mm -hmm. and encouraged me to do that. I have a wife who says to me, Darian, do you? I don't want to be something else. And we've been very fortunate to choose to live in Montgomery County Mm -hmm. that allows us to be who we are. Because my belief is that you get the best of me if I'm able to live wholly, authentically, where I get to grow with you and grow in front of you. Um, If I had to be in the closet, if I had to worry about the fact that I was the only all the time, if I had to worry about the fact that your expectations of me may not be as high as they should be, that would stifle what I could give. I don't have to worry about that. And I try to always be that person and remember that I represent something. You mentioned that TEDx talk, and I tell this story, and it reminds me, especially now we're in LGBT 
month, Pride Month, Pride right? Month, right? Yeah. And I never forget this. I've been at the college maybe two or three months, and I'm walking through the Tacoma Park campus, and this student stops me, and he walks up to me, a beautiful Latin man, and he says, uh, Doctor, are you Dr. Pollard? And he's whispering, and we kind of go through this thing. Yeah, I'm Dr. Pollard, and you are, and he tells me who he is. And then I see his eyes just start welling up, and I'm like, well, what's going on, baby? And he said, you know, I came out to my family, and I'm like, oh, I said, is everything okay? He said, well, my dad really don't have anything to do with me, but my mom, she's like, you know, you sure you're going to ruin your career, your, your options, and has really been telling me to kind of stay in and don't come out. And he said, but the day that you were named president of Montgomery College, and it was in the paper, he said, I took it home to her. He said, Mama, I may not be able to be anything, but I can be a college president one day. And the idea that the who I represented for right. him reminds me every day about why I choose to live out loud, yeah. uh, why I choose to make sure that this mission that we have is so completely real in the life of this community, because I know for a fact that we're saving lives and we're giving options to people who didn't know that they had them. Poignant words from Dr. Pollard. So when I described the stereotypical president mm-hmm. of the past, I forgot the word stuffy. You are so not stuffy. You are oh. the opposite of stuffy. I'm not <laughs> sure what the opposite of stuffy is. My vocab- vocabulary is not rich enough, but you are anti-stuffy. Mm-hmm. You must take pride in the fact that you have fun. You're as educated as any other college mm-hmm. president, but you still, you're allowed to have fun and be a person and be yourself. Yeah, I take the work seriously. I don't take myself seriously. Okay. And that's, I think that's a very, this work I do, as I tell people all the time, the college is, my colleague may even, know, I'll say all the time, you know, we're not, we're not operating on babies' brains all every minute. So we're, we should have joy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we should be remember to have laughter. We should we should take the work seriously, but don't take ourselves seriously. And I really work on that. I also, though, very intentional. I don't. I live in a community where we're just the two lesbians on the corner with a little boy. <laughs> I mean, that's what we are. They, we got the basketball court, you know, basketball rings. Uh, what uh-huh. is it called? Uh, basketball hoop in the yes. in the thing. We go to the PTA, mm-hmm. and they know, but they don't know me. They they don't they know me as they know I'm Dr. Pollard. Mm-hmm. But in the community, I'm just D. I'm Darian, and this is Robin, this is our son, Miles, and Mm -hmm. we just live our life as a part of that, and we've lived in that community since we got here. So I try to. I I never want, and on my college tomb, on my my tombstone when I die, I don't want it to say phenomenal college president. If it says that, I'm going to be so mad at somebody. (laughs) What I want it to say is she was a loving spouse, a dedicated parent, a hell of a girlfriend. She liked good tequila. She became an athlete and ran marathons, and she believed in helping her community. If that's what it says— That's all I needed to say. Well, it sounds like you wrote it, and I uh, hope somebody was taking notes. I know. But... I'm going to send it. Right, write that down, Marcus, <laughs> so we can tell them. I was going to ask you what you want your legacy to be, but you just answered, mm-hmm. the, you just answered the question. So you've been at Montgomery College for almost 10 years mm-hmm. now. What do you see yourself doing in 10, 20 years? I know it's a kind of a question that people ask all the time, but yeah. have you have you thought that far? I haven't. And, you know, it's, I've had a number of people start to ask me that because mm-hmm. I think they're trying to figure out, okay, what's next? Mm-hmm. I think about Montgomery College, though. We just, we're adopting a new strategic plan. Yep. Uh, hopefully the board will do this this month. So I have some big plans for this organization. Uh, we're going in and we're going all in on student success in a way that I think is going to transform the experience of students who come to Montgomery College. I want to rich in the work that we do with MCPS. That's going to be critical. I am so committed to the work of economic and workforce development. If Montgomery County is going to survive, if Montgomery County is going to continue to be the place that we have been, mm-hmm. we've got to do make some significant investments in economic development. So our work at the college is essential to that, to the workforce pipeline. I am tremendously committed around issues of equity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. We have to, it can't just be a mantra that's on the, you enter Montgomery County and we say we're committed to equity and inclusion. You you know, that's not authentic. We have to sit down and really talk about, and which I'm very happy about these conversations we're having at the policy level. We're thinking about who's being left behind. How do we talk to each other about these issues? So for me, I think over the next five to seven years, and I think about where we're going with the strategic plan, I think Montgomery College is going to become a brighter. 
mm-hmm. is going to, to to assume this role of an anchor institution in our community and be very proud of that. A lot of people talk about the idea of community colleges and they kind of look down on right. a particular community where you have 60 percent of Montgomery County residents have at least a baccalaureate degree, over 30 percent have advanced degrees. So their idea, they kind of look down at their community college. Mm-hmm. And I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, shake those haters off. That's <laughs> that's their issue. If right. they don't understand the value proposition that we offer, shame on us for not putting it out there, but shame on them for buying into old tropes. It's our job to make sure that they understand what we do. And we have the legacy to prove that. Our students, we have Jack Kent Cook scholars. We have our chief academic officer who won the National Chief Academic Officer of the Year Award. We have faculty who are being recognized as Maryland Professors of mm-hmm. the Year, not Community College Professors of the Year, not you know MoCo. We're talking Maryland Professors mm-hmm. of the Year. We have staff who are going out and winning awards all across this country. So for me, if you still want to buy into this old idea of what a community college is and what you think Montgomery College is doing, that's you. That ain't me. You kind of answered my next question already, but if someone was considering Montgomery College and if you had to do a 30-second elevator mm-hmm. pitch, what what would you tell them? And you kind of already did that, but what would you tell somebody who's thinking, I don't know if I want to go to Montgomery College? 30 seconds, I would say that Montgomery College believes in every student's capacity. We believe that no student is expendable, and we know that we are essential to the community. If you want just-in-time, relevant education that can get you where you are right now and take you to where you want to go, Montgomery College is the place where you need to be. You are so good. Did I do that? Is that 30 seconds? (laughs) That was probably exactly 30 seconds. That was amazing. All right, so are you ready for the lightning round? Okay, this is short answers. Okay. Let's do it. Okay, so you're from Chicago, so yes. Cubs or White Sox? White Sox, South Sider. Come South on. Sider, just making sure, yes. just making sure. Okay. Bulls, favorite player, duh. Michael Jordan, dude, come on. Okay, second favorite player. Scottie Pippen. Okay, that was predictable, but that, that's okay. That's okay, I'm not judging. Okay, not but judging. okay, how about I say Bob Kerr, uh, not Bob Kerr, Kerr. Uh, Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr. He is, Steve Kerr. He is one of my favorite people in sports. I agree. When you listen to him talk, he is so thoughtful. He is so not a just a basketball coach. Oh, and you amazing? follow him on Twitter, and oh his, and his intellectual breath, I think, he's, is wonderful. He's unbelievable. Yeah. Love, Horace Grant, I loved him too. Horace Grant, Ho Grant, yep. And Harvey used to play yes. here in D.C. Oh, yeah. so I'll tell you a funny story about those two. So the Bullets at the time were playing the Bulls at the old Capitol Center in Landover. And so it was Harvey versus Horace, brother versus twin versus twin. And one of them was getting, it was in the training room getting taped up. The other one came up to the brother. I can't remember from Harvey, which one was which, but he came up to his brother, looked him in the face. He said, you know what? And by the way, they're identical twins. He said, you're ugly. So an identical <laughs> twin. So anyway, that, that was my attempt That's at hilarious. a job. One of the things when I was, uh, actually, I'm, I'm going away from the lightning okay. round. You said in the, in the TEDx talk, I love my job. Mm. And I believe you when you say that because I can see how your eyes kind of just light up when you talk about Montgomery College. Yeah. That's the, This is no act. You actually love your job. Love Not everybody loves their job. So you feel like you're lucky that you love your job? I, I feel so supremely blessed that the universe put me where I am right now to do what I do. Uh, I honestly can't think of another job I want to be doing. There are lots of other colleges across the country that one could work at. But Montgomery College Living in this community, doing the work that we do here and the quality of life that we're able to provide for students and quality of life that I have for my family, I'm so blessed. I, and, and I wake up every day with a with a with an attitude of gratitude. I keep a gratitude journal just for that idea really? uh, of what I'm grateful for. Sometimes that list is so long that I just I can't even stop because really? I get to do this work. Man. Sixty thousand students every year we get to make sure we touch. And if we do it right, we are essential to this community. Absolutely. What's a good day for you? Good days when I get up. Like today, I ran five miles this morning. I get what? up at five o'clock in the morning. Are you I said, I'm on the fitness thing. Oh, yeah. And wow. I, I signed up for my first half marathon. I'm getting to sign up for a full marathon. So I get up. So here's I get up in the morning. I work out. I get back up. And as soon as I get up, it's usually about the time my son's waking up. So I get snuggles in the morning because he's a snuggler <laughs> and I get to get my mama kisses. And then I walk out the house. I get in the car, go to work. I eat my overnight oatmeal while I'm driving. I eat oatmeal. I love the it. real stuff. I cook my own. None of that oh, microwave. I don't, I don't, that, I don't do it. Okay. But I, overnight, I put it in with, oh, uh, with a protein shake. Oh, okay. you gotta, I'll tell you really? the recipe is phenomenal. Okay. I get to come in and then I sit and I get to go on one of the campuses. That's my 
favorite when I actually get to start the day at a campus, talk to students, go through a day where I also get to go into the community and talk about what we do. And then I get to get home before 6 p.m. That's a beautiful day. That's a good day. That's a beautiful day. I get to have dinner with my family, sometimes take a walk with Robin through the community. And then I get to get home and maybe if I'm really, really lucky, watch one of my little TV shows before I get to bed. Okay. That's really good. Well, you mentioned TV shows. I was on the list. So give me one of your TV shows, please. Well, Game of Thrones, which we can't even talk about right now. I can't because I've never seen it. So I can't talk about it. I'm so sorry. You just lost so many points for me. I know. Sorry. Oh, my God. I'm out. Okay. I'm done. But then I like like Project Runway. Okay. Oh, Survivor. Survivor. Okay. We're like an old Survivor crew. And Uh then Grey's Anatomy. That's Uh like one of my old favorites. Okay. Okay. Movie. Do you go to movies? It's hard to do that. Superhero movies now. Okay, so uh, the the Avengers. All the Avengers. All the Avengers. You've seen the current one? Yes. Okay, and you actually know all the backstories because you've seen all the previous ones. I'm really still mourning right now because of the character who. Don't tell me anything about la 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 la. I um, yeah. What book are you reading? Somebody just gave me this great book, Toni Morrison's Things. It's a collection of essays and short stories. Okay. And it is is. Tremendous, tremendous. I love Toni Morris. She's a teacher. So this idea of look, something about self-worth. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, my God. So Toni Morrison is like the queen. Okay. And music, one of my favorite topics. Yeah. So I know we can go on for probably music, hours. Yeah. So you have to listen to one song. You get time. You have three minutes, one song or one artist. Who is it? So can I say one album I listen to sure. over and over again? Lauren Hill. Oh, okay. The Lauren Miseducation? Hill. The Miseducation. Or, okay. I All could right. listen to that over and over because that's like it's the good. soundtrack of my life. Uh-huh. Her remake of Killing Me Softly uh, to me is one of the greatest covers of all time because she changed the yes, the song completely. Yes. Uh, now, you started singing. So oh. at your TEDx, you started singing. Uh, that was the beginning. Yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. a singer. I grew up singing. I grew up in the church. Okay. My sister is actually the singer of us. She's a phenomenal singer. She sang at my inauguration. She's phenomenal. Okay. Um, I sing. I sing really good in spaces where I'm by myself. But I sing. So not all the here, time. not yeah, now. Not, that's <clears> not going to no, happen. No, okay, probably just not. making sure. I have but to I ask. do. I, I sing a lot, and okay. uh, my family actually thinks I have issues because I sing all the time. <laughs> I sing all the, in my office. I sing all the time. I think singing. I think singing is a great thing. I agree. It, it's, it's and you can tell my mood by what I'm singing. If I'm singing okay. gospel that day, I grew up. You know, sorry. If I'm singing sure. gospel, if if, if, if I'm work, going through something rough, I'm just different set of songs I'm listening to. If it's something really, really good, it might be a praise song. But if I'm feeling like getting my hop on by <laughs> in the room, in my office, you, I, I have on whatever. I need a baker. Oh. I need a baker. That, you know what, that might be number two. That, that might that, be my number that. one. And so. she, when she did her little farewell tour, yes, I'm waiting I missed. for her to do back. I need to. She needs to come she back to and come do back another one. I, okay, let's, Anita Baker, come please, back to us. Please, Anita. Oh, catch please. me in the rapture. Oh, yes. You, you didn't give enough. You, what is it? Giving, giving you the best that I got. You giving didn't give enough, so you need to give one more tour, and then we'll be happy. Oh, she's singing. I love it. I love it. I love it. Did, oh. we, hear, did we pick that up? No, early? no, we, we did not. We okay. turned that out. We could go on for hours, but you have things to do. This has been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure. I want to thank Dr. Pollard for taking time out of your busy schedule for being here with us. And it was worth the wait. I can tell you that honestly. Thank and you. thank you so much for for uh, lightening our lives today. And you have an open invitation to come back anytime you want. So Marcus Rosano, uh, please, anytime you all want to come back, please, please. Marcus is Dr. Pollard's PR director, and you guys are welcome anytime. Also wanted to thank Carolyn Raskowskis, our superstar. And Sarah Chernikoff, our intern, superstar intern from Maryland. And I want to thank you for listening to MoCo's Most Famous. I'm Joe Yashroff. Until next time, have a great day, everybody. Mm-hmm.